a politician than his mouth? Well, in 1893, President Grover Cleveland's mouth was in serious trouble. This tumorous growth was discovered on the roof of his jaw and is now preserved at the Mutter. Initially diagnosed as sarcoma, something had to be done and fast. The timing of this emergency couldn't have been worse. America was in the grip of a financial crisis, the Panic of 1893. That year, several railroads went bankrupt, triggering a wave of falling stocks and bank failures. One of the worst depressions in American history loomed. To head off economic disaster, President Cleveland sought to repeal the Sherman Act, which served the interests of silver barons at the expense of everyone else. But repealing the act would not be easy. Even his vice president, a silver man himself, opposed the repeal. Cleveland would have to go directly to Congress, but he couldn't do it with a cancerous jaw. Furthermore, if news of his illness leaked out, it could generate more panic and shift power to his vice president. So, an operation was done in secret. On the night of June 30th, 1893, the president was snuck aboard the Oneida, the private yacht of a wealthy friend. The next day, the surgery took place as the yacht sailed up Long Island Sound. And the reason it was secret was because it was at a time when Cleveland had just been re-elected on the basis of repealing the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. So it was very important that nobody get an, any idea that he was possibly sick with cancer and might lose control of the party. It was a major bit of surgery. Most of the president's upper jaw, from the first bicuspid to the last molar, was removed. Yet, no visible sign that an operation took place could be allowed. So the surgeon, Dr. William Keene, performed the procedure making no external incisions at all, with the help of this dental mirror and this cheek retractor, which he had bought in Paris years before. Once the jaw was removed, a dentist, Dr. Casson Gibson, was called in to replace it with an artificial jaw made of vulcanized rubber, which replaced his palate. Remarkably, after the operation, there was no change in the president's appearance, and his speech was unaffected. Cleveland appeared before a special session of Congress on August 17th and successfully pushed for repeal of the Sherman Act. A national disaster was averted, and the news of the president's cancer remained secret for the next 20 years. Less dramatic than this was the operation on Chief Justice John Marshall in 1831 to remove these stones from his bladder. Marshall became one of the most important of all Supreme Court justices, and he lived years beyond the operation. Equally prominent in his field was the doctor who performed the operation, Dr. Philip Singh Physic, known as the father of American surgery. Removing bladder stones was an area of his expertise. It required an arsenal of specialized tools for extracting mineral buildups in the body, called calculi. And the mutter has a 50-year collection of such specimens that looks almost like a jar full of seashells. Delving into the depths of your basement or the back shelves of your attic can turn up some real surprises. But searching the storerooms of the Mutter can unearth incredible finds that you won't see on the Antiques Roadshow. Imagine rummaging through old storage and coming up with a baking powder can containing tissue from the vertebra of John Wilkes Booth, the Confederate sympathizer who assassinated President Lincoln. We have a specimen that it was originally identified as a piece of the thorax of John Wilkes Booth set up to us by the Surgeon General after the post-mortem examination of Booth in 1865. Booth supported the Southern cause, but he never fought in the war. Feeling guilty, he and a few conspirators decided to kidnap Lincoln and hold him hostage until the U.S. recognized the Confederacy. 
when General Lee surrendered to Grant on April 10th of 1865, Booth's plan changed to murder. Booth shot Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington. After firing the gun, he leapt onto the stage and broke his ankle. As the president slumped in the balcony, Booth hobbled outside to a waiting horse and made his escape. Lincoln died in bed the next morning. Booth was pursued for the next 11 days and was finally cornered and shot to death in a tobacco barn in Virginia. We're not quite sure exactly what part of Booth it is. We think now it is uh, material removed from his neck. The bullet hit the fourth vertebra, shown on this model. They were interested in that area because that's where the bullet went through his neck. It partially paralyzed him, and so he was instantly a quadriplegic and died a few hours later as respiration ceased. An autopsy was performed, and this spinal tissue was removed. As for how it got to the mutter, it was sent there by the Surgeon General after being removed from three of Booth's vertebrae that were kept at the Army Medical Museum, a museum which, in 1867, had moved to the Ford Theater Building, site of the assassination. But the most fascinating historical display at the Mutter may well be the plaster death cast of Chang and Eng Bunker, the original Siamese twins. Born in Bangkok in 1811, they caused a sensation from their first day of life. In their hometown, they were known as the Chinese twins, since they were three-quarters Chinese. Chang and Eng were connected at the chest there was a band of cartilage about five inches long that was between them. It was fairly flexible so they could stand side by side. They shared a liver and they also shared the diaphragm. Chang and Eng were identical twins, meaning they shared all their genes in common. And in fact, all conjoined twins are identical. They put themselves on display to make money, but they refused to live their lives as a freak show. They married and had children, 21 children in all. Their brides were sisters, Sarah Ann and Adelaide Yates. And they set up home on neighboring farms in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Chang had the more orderly home. Eng's was less so, reflecting his more laid back personality. Chang and Eng actually had quite different personalities, and it's known that Chang was the more irritable of the two, and he was highly predisposed towards drinking, which his brother was not, and in fact, the two of them ended up having a fist fight over exactly that. Though they consulted doctors about being separated, it was not possible then because they were joined at the liver, which can also be seen at the museum. It's a fascinating phenomenon, but it is not well understood. In fact, we don't even know what causes ordinary identical twinning to occur. Chang and Eng's story is medically important because the contrast between their experience and that of normal identical twins provides insight into the origins of personality. The conjoined twins that we've known of so far have very, very different personalities. And I think this is quite surprising to most people because you would assume that because they share such a common environment, they should really end up being very similar. And of course, they share the genetic backgrounds. But when two people find themselves in such close quarters, there is probably a real pressing need to differentiate and to develop their own identities. Chang died of a cerebral clot in 1874 at the age of 63. Eng died an hour later. Separating conjoined twins has only recently been successful with the help of state-of-the-art technology. And it's the evolution of medical technology that is also preserved at the Mutter. It was in ancient Greece that the internal structures of the body were first explored but only by examining the hacked up bodies of fallen warriors. Even the inquisitive Greeks refused to defile a corpse. Public displays of the world within us were not pioneered until the 18th century enlightenment. 
the era of scientific fervor that produced places like the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and its museum